Dobro jutro svima. U ime organizacijskog odbora ovoga skupa pozdravljam sve vas prisutne u dvorani kao i one koji nas prate putem Zuma. Naš obljetnički skup Enciklopedika 2020 dosezi i izazovi podijelili smo u četiri cijeline, digitalnu, leksikološku, opću enciklopedičku i biografsku. Na skupu će sudjelovati 69 domaćih i inozemnih izlagača sa 53 izlaganja. Kombinirano, uživo i putem Zuma, u dva dana moći ćemo ih čuti, a sva će izlaganja biti dostupna i nakon skupa preko neke od internetskih platformi, odnosno kanala. Radove ćemo objaviti u našem znanstvenom časopisu za leksikografiju i enciklopedistiku studija leksikografika. Sve izlagače molim da se drže predviđenog vremena trajanja svojih izlaganja, znači 15 minuta. Zavodu prvo čestitam 70. rođendane, zahvaljujem svima koji su pomogli organizaciji ovoga skupa. A sad želim pozdraviti i moderatore naše prijepodnevne sesije, digitalna enciklopedika i umreženo znanje. To su profesor na Zagrebačkom filozofskom fakultetu, socijeka za informacijske i komunikacijske znanosti Hrvoje Stančić, kojeg pozdravljam putem Zuma, i Natoša Jermen iz Leksikografskog zavoda Miroslav Krleža, pomoćnica ravnatelja za znanstveni rad i međuinstitucijsku suradnju. Natoša, izvoli, svima drugima hvala. Evo, zahvaljujem Iva i ja također pozdravljam ovdje sve prisutne članove organizacijskog odbora, programskog odbora, sudionike, drage kolegice i kolege. I naravno sve one koji nas prate putem Zuma. Ali dozvolite prvo, budući da je ovo ipak međunarodni skup, da se prvo obratim i našim sudionicima i pratiteljima iz inozemstva. So on, the, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome our international participants and attendees across Europe and North America. And I would like to thank you all once again uh, for joining us in this effort to organize a conference in these unpleasant times, given the global health crisis. Anyhow, we managed to organize the conference both as the physical event, event here on the premises of the Miroslav Krleža Institute of Lexicography, as well as online via the uh, Zoom platform. Uh, all in all, the conference finally gathered uh, 64 participants and uh, 53 speeches and presentations. Uh, I believe that you are already familiar with the conference program, which is also available at our uh, web pages. Uh, but let me just briefly um, lead you through today's schedule. Uh, firstly, we will start with a keynote speech given by uh, Toma Tasovac from Berlin, uh, who is already here with us. Uh, the first day of the conference is uh, dedicated to the topic Digital Encyclopedia and Knowledge Networking, which will be divided into session. The afternoon session will start with the second keynote speech given by Evelyn van der Vogt. Is it okay? Yeah. And finally, in the afternoon, we will have the honor to listen to the two remaining keynote speakers for today, Naya Benson and Yuri Nordelman. Uh, I would kindly ask you, the participants, uh, to join the meetings at least 10 minutes before uh, the beginning of their session. And of course, anyone who is interested in, in joining us and following other sessions, uh, anyway, you're free to join us and leave whenever you, you want. So the links are available also at our website. Uh, I would also like to remind uh, you to strictly stick to the time schedule, this 15 minutes for per, per presentation, as we are tight on time. And last but not least, I would like to invite you to submit your papers based on the, on the presentations given at this conference for publication in our peer-reviewed uh, journal Studia Lexicografica. I sincerely hope that you will enjoy uh, being with us today and tomorrow. Uh, that's all from me for now, and over to you, Hervoje. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, it was uh, my privilege to, it is my privilege to uh, moderate this first session. So let me introduce our uh, first uh, international uh, speaker. He is uh, Thomas Tasovat, uh, and he is the director of the Belgrade Center for Digital Humanities. 
and he is also uh, the director of the RAIA, the Digital Research Infrastructure for the Arts and Humanities. His fields of uh, interest include lexicography, data modeling, uh, text encoding initiative, digital editions, and research infrastructures. So uh, let me uh, uh, give the floor to our first speaker, Mr. Toma Tasovac. Toma, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, um, and, and if you can turn off your microphones because I'm hearing, hearing an echo of myself. Um, so, good morning and, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference. I wish I could have joined you um, in person, but as my previous speakers already mentioned, we live in strange times and this is not the first but the second event in Zagreb that I won't be able to participate because we were also planning to organize the Daria annual event in Zagreb this year. So, uh, but we'll try to make the most of this um, in this virtual uh, session. Um, the use of computers in manipulating humanistic texts dates back to the, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still hearing um, echoes. So if you can make sure that every, every microphone is off, I would really appreciate it. So to start again, um, the use of computers in manipulating humanistic texts dates back to the concordancing of the um, works of St. Thomas Aquinas by um, Jesuit priest and scholar Roberto Bussa. Uh, while conducting research of his, for his 1949 doctoral dissertation on the metaphysics of presence in St. Thomas Aquinas, Bussa realized, and I quote, that a philological and lexicographic inquiry into the verbal systems of an author has to proceed and prepare for a doctrinal interpretation of his work. So to create an index domesticus, a concordance of all the words of Thomas Aquinas, he also concluded that he needed to look for, I quote, some type of machinery in order to process more than 10 million words. Bulsa managed to get IBM's founder, Thomas Watson, on board, which was no small feat considering that the punch card machines, the most advanced computer technology of the time, were not meant to process text, but rather uh, to crunch numbers. And the cumbersome nature of text input and the uh, limitation in the number of characters that could be represented on each card would plague humanities scholars and lexicographers for decades. Yet the use of data processing techniques, which had been developed primarily for science and commerce, would not only prove to be a significant factor in um, facilitating information retrieval and textual analysis, but it would, as an IBM engineer and one of Busa's collaborators noted at the time, it would initiate a new era of language engineering. The first provisional results of Busa's cooperation with IBM came in 1951 when Busa presented his, and this is the title of the work, first example of a word index automatically compiled and printed by IBM punch card machines. Um, over the next three decades, Busa and his assist assistants lemmatized and indexed the entire works of St. Thomas Aquinas, moving from punch cards to magnetic tapes and eventually producing in 1980, the 56 volume index domesticus on paper. The data was eventually transferred onto CD-ROM in 92 and, and the website in 2005. But the interesting thing here is, well, there's two things. One, that um, a similar process in which the computer medium turned from a tool assisting in the production of paper dictionaries to a tool for distributing and consulting dictionaries themselves uh, has actually characterized the development of electronic lexicography as well. So we, we, we can watch how technology developed at first to help prepare lexicographers work on paper dictionaries, but event only much later did the idea um, and the technological framework was there uh, to, uh, it was possible to actually create dictionaries that would be used um, electronically. Um, the 60s brought um, a new kind of excitement to the world of lexicographers and one of the earliest examples of the computer assisted preparation of a paper dictionary 
was the Random House Dictionary of the English Language, whose production system was designated by um, Lawrence Ordung. Um, the decision to make a large unabridged dictionary of about 260,000 entries, um, twice as many as the American College Dictionary of 1947, was made in 1959. Ordung and his team uh, hoped to use computers to do the sorting, codifying, rearranging, and checking the data at hand and the text to be written. Using forms specially designated for this, per designed for this purpose, the uh, 130 odd thousand entries from the ACD were punched into standard 80 column cards. Um, dictionary data was divided into seven categories, illustrations, main entry words, including pronunciations and inflected forms, definitions, variations, etymologies, um, so-called run-on entries, so undefined words formed by the addition of suffixes to the main entry word, and additional information like synonym studies, usage notes, etc. The definitions were furthermore annotated using 158 subject fields such as physics, chemistry, etc. And the explicit terminological labeling made it possible to retrieve each of the subject fields for specialists to review the copy. And I find these early examples fascinating because this is, we're still talking about 60s, we're still way um, far from, from the advent of internet and, and uh, online media, et cetera. Yet the sophistication and the understanding of the dictionary data and the structure and the attempt to, to represent it using, um, what we now consider antiquated technologies such as magnetic tapes and things like that um, shows a great great deal of ambition and and really no small achievements um, the acd data was converted to paper tape and printed out for editors to work with and this is another um, point which is interesting for uh, from the point of view of media history is that um, at this time computers could process text but the the actual editing was still happening on paper and i also remember speaking once to a lexicographer who was working on the collins cobble dictionary the first uh, modern dictionary based on a on a uh, fully based on a corpus that that work included you know didn't do <laughs> didn't do um good things for the environment in the sense that a lot of paper was wasted for printing out even printing out the concordancing themselves so that people would then work on on their dictionary entries etc so things were quite different i think we have to remember um, than they are today uh, more than 200 outside consultants reviewed the contents of the new dictionary and after another set of corrections the constant contents were sent to operators who punched the contents of the dictionary back onto 700,000 feet, which is over 200 kilometers of paper tape. Um, and then separate computer programming firms were employed to convert the paper tape to magnetic tape and produce the final alphabetic order of the dictionary. All this to say and to show how cumbersome and complicated uh, the process was at the time. Um, so sometimes today when I hear colleagues complaining that um, you know, there's uh, soft um, corpus software or dictionary writing software is complicated or doesn't do things uh, the way they want to. Uh, they would like to see. I I often um, want to tell them you we really have it good in comparison to how our colleagues were working only a few decades ago. Um, it was the structural underpinnings of lexicographic works and the wealth of linguistic data contained in them that led scholars to explore the idea of producing the first machine readable versions of already published uh, print dictionaries as well. Um, and with the initial goal of developing a formal semantic description of the English language consisting of a set of lexical entries and a system of rules to determine appropriate readings of both individual sentences and connected text, only at al um, described two uh, transcribed two english dictionaries uh, webster's seventh new I I collegiate dictionary and the new merriam webster pocket dictionary into machine readable forms and developed applications to use them in computational lexical research 
um, a study of word frequencies at the time in dictionary definitions at the time, for instance, would empirically confirm that the most frequent words used to define senses in these dictionaries, terms such as substance, coat, thing, kind, possess, were practically identical to the semantic primitives in AI or in linguistic theories. Um, areas of study in which the first MRDs would eventually be applied included taxonomy extraction, um, text analysis, speech processing, syntactic and semantic parsing, detection of circular definitions, etc. Um, after W7 was converted to a ma machine readable format in 1968, Donald Sherman developed an elaborate lexicographic data format to standardize the representation of dictionary entries. He based his format on MARC, machine readable catalog, uh, the Library of Congress standard for exchange of bibliographic data. Sherman's webmark used mark-like scheme to tag individual components of a dictionary entry, such as spelling variants, etymologies, definitions, etc., and make them accessible independent of each other. The subfield structure of pronunciations, for instance, was detailed enough to label individual consonant and vowel segments. With this type of markup, it was possible to use the computer to search for patterns of phonetic data and answer questions such as, what English words exhibit vowel tensing in a syllable preceding a bivocalic sequence, such as area, gymnasium, etc.? cetera. Um, the promise of dictionaries stored as computer files did not only have to do with general access to individual dictionaries or the ability to search and filter their contacts, uh, contents for particular queries. The true promise, of machine readable dictionaries was seen in their extensibility and transferability. Um, and this is what Sherman wrote, one of the advantages of computer files of a printed text is their capacity to absorb additional information as a result of being compared and merged with other data files. Sherman clearly understood the potential of digitizing other dictionaries. He explicitly mentions Daniel Jones' English Pronouncing Dictionary, uh, which if converted to webmark would provide a basis for a systemic, uh, systematic lexical comparison of British and American pronunciations. But he also stresses the need for digitizing all the dictionaries of the English language because of their great linguistic value and because historical analysis, um, uh, historical data can best be analyzed and compared in computer files. Um, we don't have time to go into a lot of details, but it's important for me to point out that the, the 60s computer methodology, methodology was not um, employed only in English-based dictionaries. Of course, the examples that I've cited so far were, were coming from the English language, but there were numerous other projects at the time um, that realized the potential of digitizing textual material and using computer technology in the production of di dictionaries, including the Trésor de la Langue Française, the Lexical Archive of the Italian Language, uh, the Dictionary of the Older Scottish Tongue, uh, the Hebrew Historical Dictionary, the early work um, in Russia on automatization and statistics in lexicology and lexicography, which is um, fascinating and, and, and often ignored um, in the Western context. Um, there was even a plan for the mechanical processing of an etym etymological dictionary of Hungarian, etc. So there were numerous attempts um, to start using computers in languages other than English. But for me personally, when we get to the 70s, this is, this is where things get interesting. So uh, in 1973, the New York Academy of Sciences hosted a lexicography conference, which brought together some of the leading figures of the field and included a section dedicated to, to the use of technology in lexicography. Uh, the conference was an opportunity for lexicographers to take stock of ongoing efforts in the field, but also to look towards the future. Uh, by this time, there is practically no doubt about, um, um, there's no doubt among practitioners in the field that the future of dictionaries will be electronic. 
At the same time, however, the increased mechanization of um, lexicographic production is seen as a double-edged sword. The standardization and formalization of lexicographic data is believed to be an asset because it can lead to, for instance, better indexing and therefore more complex and mutually compatible resources. But all this at the cost of glossing over various irregularities and inconsistencies of language. So what were the features of an ideal dictionary from the point of view of researchers in the 70s? In a playfully titled contribution, How to Make a Nude, a New Utopian Dictionary of the English Language, Revert engages in a stimulating exercise of lexicographic wishful thinking. He assumes, for the sake of the argument, a utopia in which lexicographers will be given unlimited funds, perfect facilities, innumerable expert staff, and sufficient time, and asked to produce the best dictionary they can imagine. He focuses on two main requirements for such a phantasmic dictionary. One, the need for lexicographic data to be computer accessible so that it can be studied backwards, forwards, and inside out. And two, the need to offer preliminary, preliminary analysis of the possible types of semantic relations between word senses. Machine readable data should not only include citation slips, but also the previous dictionaries in the language we should be mutually aligned into full concordances. This, according to Revert, will improve the consistency of lexicographic definitions, their style and format. For Revert, the manipulability of the electronic text is a major asset. He envisages a scenario in which an electronic version of the properly formatted Oxford English Dictionary would be available to the researcher along with the properly uh, prehensile software, which could, and I quote, turn the OED inside out in a number of ways, end quote, by ordering the data according to chronology or usage labels, etc. But Rever doesn't stop there. In terms of the genealogy of lexicographic knowledge, his coupling of machine tractability and manipulability of individual bits of dictionary data on the one hand, with a clearly articulated need to record semantic relations between different dictionary senses, strikes one as not only very forward-looking, but also uh, indicative of a very deep engagement with the complexity of the dictionary genre. What Rebert wants from an exemplary, if fictitious, dictionary is not just to be a properly indexed relational database in the modern sense of the word. He wants it to be a lexical network. And Revert admits, however, with self-irony, that in his utopia, there are no copyright problems. Revert and his colleagues did not see the use of computers in the production of future dictionaries exclusively as a time or cost-saving measure. Speed was certainly considered as one important aspect of what computer technolo technology had to bring to the table. But equally important was the realization that technology imposes structure on data and conditions research output. Um, the outcome of our research will be conditioned by the devices we use in its uh, execution. Um, according to Revert, the formal aspects of dictionary definitions um, and a general attempt to create structured data can actually be quite beneficial in the study of language precisely because not everything that occurs in language can easily fit regular structures. According to Revert, the increased level of formalization can lead lexicographers to discover exceptions which are interesting in their own right. In other words, systemic thinking about language is increasing both because of of the parts that fit the system, yeah, i.e. the nodes of the network, and those that clearly do not, yeah, the holes in the system. So a failure of a system is part of its own success. Uh, Bailey uh, raises an enormously important issue about the nature of lexicographic structures, the contrast between what he calls linguistic facts and uh, quote unquote life of the community. Um, he quotes the attempt of Charles Fry's in a 1932 sample of his early modern English dictionary to introduce a category for imprecise citations, where it is 
impossible to determine, determine the precise meaning of the word. Fry subsequently abandoned this idea after being criticized uh, for it. But Bailey is concerned here that the use of technology can actually damage the integrity of data. When lexicographers quote only those sources where the word in question is easily attributable to a particular word sense, they're making their data fit a system which is much neater and better organized than language itself. Bailey's argument, however, does not only reflect his misgivings about sense disambiguation as such, his argument touches upon an even more fundamental question about the role of human intervention in the automatic processing of lexical data. We cannot reasonably expect the computer to execute the direction that Murray issued to the volunteer readers for his dictionary. Make a quotation for every word that strikes you, O oh machina, as rare, obsolete, old-fashioned, new, peculiar, or used in a peculiar way. It should come as no surprise that uh, lexicographers in the early 70s, working in a field not yet dominated by corpus lexicography, uh, frequency lists, and statistical passions, are still very much confident in the primacy of linguistic intuition. Um, this is what one author said, I'm sure that these machines, no matter what champion speed readers they may be, will not e ever be able to supplant the human reader with his sensitivity and Sprachgefühl. Um, scholars emphasize the continued significance of the lexicographer in what was already becoming a computer dominated discipline because they felt the computer could replace neither the selfless volunteers of bygone days nor Murray's pigeonholes um, so delicately imposed on the lexicon. The, the pigeonholes is a reference to the, to, to the shelves that were created to hold the citation slips of the OAD um, famously. Um, it is this same kind of championing the humanistic aspects of dictionary production which led uh, Veneschi, another author, uh, to conclude that we are now near the saturation point. That is, we've gone about as far as we can go in developing new applications under the current rules of the game. And any further qualitative advantage to be offered by automation will require a revolution in both semantic analysis techniques and in the interaction between lexicographers and computer lexicographer and computers. Um, I think it's important to to um, view this statement as a as a cautionary tale in the sense because uh, I think we often tend to forget that we are ourselves at this particular moment still in the early stages of um, computational lexicography. Dictionaries have been around for thousands of years, yet all ele electronic dictionaries for only 60 or 70 years. And it would be wrong and, and quite disappointing to assume that we ourselves have reached the, the kind of the pinnacle of technological development and that no innovation is uh, uh, possible anymore. And, and, and studying and looking at these early examples of, of um, dealing with computers and lexicography is a, is a very good reminder of that. Despite the fact that um, lexicographers in the early, in the 70s could not imagine the scope of technological change that would be ushered in by the advent of the internet, they were already articulating a need for infrastructural services that would provide high quality data to researchers. One such infrastructural service was uh, Barnhart's proposal for a central archive for lexicography in English. It envisioned a collection of uh, 25 to 30 million quotations for some 500,000 lexical items of written international English selected on the basis of frequency, rage, and quote-unquote cruciality 
um, the critical importance of the basic vocabulary of a particular field of knowledge that has little to do with frequency or range. Despite the fact that lexicographers in the 70s, uh, sorry, uh, it would be wrong to see the proposed archive as an equivalent or even a direct precursor to linguistic corpora that dominate the field of lexicography today. Corpora are searchable collections of authentic texts. They are not meant to be artificially created by linguists to fit a predefined theory, nor are they supposed to be tainted by the personal idiolect intuition or introspection of the researcher. Corpora constitute to a large extent raw data, although as we know the process of selecting texts for a corpus and the very notion of a balanced and representative corpus are far from mechanical and random. So the proposed lexicographic archive could be best described as a corpus of annotated excerpts specifically geared towards illustrating um, individual lexical items. Um, the archive will, this is what Lehman wrote, the archive will have to assemble phonological, paradigmatic, syntactic, and semantic information for lexical items, enlist the syntactic and semantic properties of constituents required in the syntactic environments of these items. It will have to establish the implication relations between such properties. It will also have to establish the logical relations between the meanings of linguistic items. When I look at our dictionaries uh, that are being produced today, I wonder how far have we really uh, progressed since those times. The depository where qualified collectors may send quotation files should be um, systematically voracious, and this is a quote, systematically voracious, omnivorous in its appetite for linguistic material, and an ingeniously computerized bank usable for research in grammar, as well as in the more traditional concerns of lexicography. Um, long before the internet, before the participatory turn of Web 2.0 and social media, lexicographers realized the potential of computer technology for scholarly communication and collaboration. Socialized lexicography, in short, is now upon us, Bailey proclaimed, referring to capacity for sustained and continuous growth through addition or deletion of information, and the chance of scholars from different institutions to work on various dictionary projects together. Still important to this day is Bailey's earlier call to data sharing. For a relatively low cost, the citation file itself can be published on microfiche, making the evidence, if not the interpretation of the evidence, available to scholars before a generation or two has passed. Um, the format du jour may have changed. Microfiches have no place in the age of cloud computing, but the need for open access to scholarly data has remained an essential requirement for the creation of digital research infrastructures. And another parallel that we can see is also between uh, what some uh, modern dictionaries do, which is linking to, to corpora and to further examples, um, and the way Bailey was proposing that we should also share citation slips and raw data in order to provide as complete a picture as possible. Um, with an increasing number of projects using and producing machine-readable dictionaries as repositories of grammatical, semantic, and encyclopedic information, the 80s saw the emergence of the computational lexicography as a discipline in, in its own right. The fact that lexicographers need large bodies of diverse text in order to adequately describe language was becoming more widely accepted and acted upon. At the same time, it became increasingly clear that a large number of incompatible data formats could be a major obstacle for the development of the field. Um, the lexicons for natural language processing were at the time mostly illustrative and not large enough with very little consensus on what the nature of lexical data is or how it should be represented. Uh, one, MRD in particular, the Longman Dictionary of Contemporary English, took up a, a prominent position as the favorite uh, object of computation. The, the choice of this dictionary for computation analysis were propelled by two factors, the fact that the dictionary publisher agreed to offer its computer files to researchers, and the fact that the very structure of the LDOC as a dictionary aimed at foreign learners of English made it particularly suitable candidate for the automatized 
computation, uh, computational extraction of data. Uh, this is because the dictionary had special grammatical codes, including valency. It even had semantic codes so that you could in, 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 you know, indicate that the verb persuade requires a human um, object. And finally, its definitional vocabulary was restricted to 2000 items, which made it very useful for you know, the study of definitions themselves. In addition, um, to the use of dictionaries for developing NLP resources, the 80s also saw the first um, successful efforts in the creation of MRDs for direct human um, consumption. Of course, when they spoke of online environments at the time, this was before the internet, that was referring really to local network of workstations rather than a global uh, network that the internet would become. A typical example of a dictionary query that Bogorayev cites that, that these new dictionaries could, could um, fulfill is this, the user wishes to see all entries for three syllable nouns which describe movable solid objects whose second syllable has a schwa as a peak and whose third syllable has a coda that is a voice dot which still indicates the use of MRD for linguistic research more than the general dictionary use. And I also like this example because, you know, if you are trying to, you know, fi find funding for your dictionary projects and you want to sell the idea, don't go with a statement like this because it won't, it won't appeal, um, I think, to your funders. It's very niche and very linguistic, whereas dictionaries, of course, have much, uh, much wider use than that. The development of common standards for the representation of lexical data was therefore seen as a sine qua non from the early days of manipulating lexical data with the help of computers. Um, Sherman, did, whom we mentioned in the context of Webmark, said if a standard data structure were to be used as a common defining medium for different records, formats, and databases, then this common structure could serve as a unifying basis for exchanging and integrated related materials. A common data structure would at least standardize our vocabulary for describing and documenting database format and content. Um, and this is something that we have to ask ourselves too. Have we managed to reach a point where even our um, vocabulary for describing what we do is, is fully standardized? The 80s saw uh, slow development towards uh, a standard for the representation of uh, textual data, starting with generalized markup language, uh, followed by uh, SGML, and finally XML, that is uh, W3C standard, and that you are, I'm sure, all aware of. But what does all this mean? And what do we gain from looking back at an early history of um, electronic lexicography, I decided not to talk about um, the internet and if everything that has happened since the 90s, because that is the story that we know much better, right? This, this part of the early age, uh, years of electronic lexicography are not researched as much. Um, what all this means is that, um, first of all, <laughs> um, a history of electronic lexicography is yet to be written. I think it's it's going to be an exciting history, and 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 I I hope we'll be able to extract more um, information, more knowledge about the visions that the early lexicographers had, and then compare those we with where we are today. Um, the goal of my talk was certainly not to provide a detailed history. You can't do that in in half an hour it also wasn't to tell a self-congratulatory narrative of technological progress, quite the contrary. Um, I think the discussion, um, this discussion shows that this future history of electronic lexicography will have a lot to teach us, not only about how far we have come, but also how far we still have to go. Uh, we are yet to put into practice a truly socialized lexicography, an infrastructure that would make it possible for scholars all over the world to collaboratively update, annotate, interlink, and discuss dictionaries. Uh, we are yet to find a sensible research-friendly solution to the problems related to copyright. 
And we are yet to make significant advances in the study of lexicographic complexity and ambiguity in the electronic age. Just because dictionaries and XML-based technologies seem like such a natural fit doesn't mean that we should not think about uh, what gets left out by language models derived from structured data. A more detailed exploration of these and similar issues could not only help us gain a better understanding of the early trajectories of our field, but also perhaps shed new light on the problems we mistakenly considered solved. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Toma. This was uh, really an interesting, um, an interesting topic to uh, hear about. And as you have said, it is not um, uh, customary to listen uh, about the history of lexicography. This makes your topic um, even more interesting. So uh, I will start by uh, saying that we have uh, one interesting comment in the Q and A session. Uh, so I will read it out and ask you if you could just briefly comment on that. So it says in Nancy, which is a French town, for the TLF project in the 60s, which is the treasure uh, of the French language uh, project in the 60s, uh, the computing center was up the hill and someone uh, would bring the printed uh, concordances to the National Institute uh, for French Language down the hill. And it says, Google Maps says it is 7.2 kilometers. That, that's lovely. Yes. Uh, thank you, Laurent, for this uh, beautiful example, which I can then add to, to further um, revisions of this talk. Um, yes, that's, that refers to, to this, this kind of absurd situation that I mentioned, that, that the early technology was not good enough to, to you know, you couldn't do the full workflow uh, using computers, but uh, only process the data, yet a lot of work was still happening um, on paper. But I have to say there also, uh, because I, I think we need to be fair. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I always try to stress that technology is just technology, it's not the, you know, the, the alpha and omega of what we do, it's just a tool, but also something that, that will continue to develop is that even today, right? Um, there are still dictionaries in Europe being written in Microsoft Word. Uh, there are still dictionaries that are not um, from the conception of it uh, treated as structured data. Um, there are still lexicographic institutes in Europe who are not willing to share their data, who are, who are very protective of their um, lexical um, data sets. Um, which can, of course, then lead to, um, which is a serious obstacle for the for the creation of this open, um, socialized um, lexicographic landscape that some people in the seventies were already uh, imagining. So, uh, the the message of my keynote is not that uh, we are smarter than those people were, but that there is still an incredible amount of work left to be done by us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So now I would like to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience, uh, either the um, uh, attendees from the uh, Zoom or panelists or uh, from the uh, from the attendees uh, in in uh, the Institute of Lexicography. So, are there any uh, questions? I could ask uh, a question, Toma Dobrujutro, uh, good morning. Uh, well, uh, uh, Toma Tazovac is uh, uh, director of DARIA, Digital Research Infrastructure for Arts and uh, Humanities. And maybe to clarify it a bit to our participants who are, may not pertain to the digital community and are not necessarily familiar with uh, uh, DARIA uh, as an ERIC, European Research Infrastructure Consortium. Can you maybe tell us what are the main focuses, challenges, and possibilities of uh, DARIA, uh, especially with regard uh, to the main topics covered by uh, today's uh, and tomorrow's conference, that is encyclopedistics, uh, lexicography apart, you already told us about it. <laughs> 
uh, in your talk and maybe biographies in the digital environment? Yeah, um, thank you, Natasha. I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, hear you well. Uh, for some reason, when, when, when you use that microphone, it doesn't, doesn't translate well to, to Zoom. But uh, the question was about Daria. Um, and, and from what I could gather, um, it's, it's almost you shouldn't have asked me because there's, uh, there's, a, there's a million things um, we could talk about. But, but I want to stress two, two keywords. One is research, uh, is infrastructure, and the other is, is openness. Um, and when we talk about research infrastructures, I, and especially for the humanities, and there I include lexicography, encyclopedistics, etc. It's important to remember we're not only talking about hardware and software, we're also talking about people who form part of that infrastructure. And most importantly, and above all, we are talking about tacit, implicit and explicit knowledge that we create and gather that goes into building uh, these infrastructures. And, and one of the very important activities that we've been doing within Daria as part of the work with, of the of the um, working group for lexical data, which is co-chaired by me and Laurent Romary, is we've been working on the development of TILX zero, which is a which is a standard for describing uh, lexicographic data, which is aligned with TEI, the Text Encoding Initiative, which is the de facto standards for all humanities texts, but which is created um, to be a more um, precise and, and, and um, more strict subset of TEI in order to enable a better data exchange and comparison between dictionaries, et cetera. Why is this important? Uh, you cannot create an infrastructure if you don't have uh, this kind of uh, common understandings of the data model and so that you can actually take 10 different dictionaries and, and compare their content. The other part, which I mentioned is very important from the point of view of Daria, is openness. So TI like zero is developed as part of this working group and also in association with Alexis, the European Lexicographic Infrastructure, which is a Horizon 2020 funded project. All our work is uh, available on GitHub. Um, we take um, comments, feedbacks from the community, and we all work on it together. It is, it, those are two um, crucial, I think, things, uh, knowledge and openness. Um, and as I also mentioned in, in one of my earlier answers, technology is not always the, the stumbling block. Sometimes it is such social and cultural assumptions and implications of those assumptions that are um, uh, that present an, an sometimes insurmountable obstacle. Things like copyright, things like um, self-censorship in a way when, when institutes feel um, that if they release their data into the open, something dangerous will happen. Somebody will claim their data and things like that. So to build an infrastructure like Daria, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a life uh, you know, project for the entire lifetime. But I think, especially nowadays, um, and with Alexis, there's there's a great deal of interest, and with Clarin, our our partner uh, research infrastructure, there's a great deal of interest, um, at least in Europe, about the infrastructural aspects of lexicography, um, and I very much hope that um, in the next years and decades we'll see uh, the fruition of our uh, work in this field. Uh -huh. uh also, I would like to say that uh, Laurent also mentioned that uh, the, the, consent, the consent with the uh, tension between standardization and lexicographic freedom, and asks you if you could elaborate a little bit on the consequences for standardization work uh, you currently do. Yeah, I, this is something that we often um, encounter, especially when working with with historical dictionaries, which we which I do in my own work, um, is that that um, once you start using computers to produce dictionaries, you tend to end up with more more properly structured and consistent data, etc. Even though there you you there are, there are um, exceptions, but when we look at you know single author lexicographers or or even uh, big 
dictionary project that developed over time and then changed their editorial policy, for instance, over time, etc. Sometimes you get a feeling that that um, data models that we impose on dictionaries present a um, you know straight jacket that that somehow goes against the grain of um, lexicographic freedom. I don't think that is actually the case. I think it's just a matter of um, us being clever enough and working hard enough on properly annotating these data and and making sure that our annotation is itself attributed um that it's clear who is annotating what who 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 inserted a note here was it the original uh, author or the editor or the digitizer etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think there's a lot of uh, techniques we can use to to make sure that we don't um change the the original text um or rather to keep the the clear distinction between what is the original text and what is the the kind of interpretation that comes on top of it um i'm the last person in the world who will who will fight against lexicographic freedom and in fact in my own work i i love i love strange dictionaries i love weird definitions and and i very much hope that even though we it's the right thing to move towards corpus linguistics in lexicography for modern day dictionaries. Um, I very much hope that lexicography will never um, forget that uh, it shouldn't be only about statistics. It shouldn't be only about, um, you know, the, the average use, but that it is part of the humanistic tradition to explore also the outliers, the weird things, things that don't fit the model, etc. So in a way, um, I, I, I am both, sometimes I feel very conservative when I say these things, but I really, really hope that we will continue to appreciate um, the strangeness of language through our dictionaries in the future as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you for uh, walking us through the, through the topic of imagining the future of dictionaries. Uh, tracing the early history of uh, e-lexicography, but also offering us uh, a few thoughts on uh, the future of history of lexicography, as you have uh, put it. So uh, right. thank you once again for your uh, keynote today. Uh, I think that we will have a break now for uh, 15 minutes, but I'll, I'll turn over to uh, Natasha to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, Toma, once again, from my part as well. And let me say one more time how sorry I am that you couldn't be here with us today. But hopefully we will see each other next year in Zagreb again. Same here. Yeah. Trust me. Not the same. <laughs> uh, and for the rest of our participants and listeners, I would like also to thank you all. And uh, now we will have a short 15, less than 15 minute, minutes break for a coffee. We'll be back in 10.30. Uh,